So welcome. Thanks everyone for coming tonight to the Portland Trails annual meeting. If you're a member, this is your meeting. You're the ones who vote for our officers, those folks that direct the organization, uh, officers and new board members. So please make sure that you've signed in. I think we caught everyone, but if you didn't sign in, please, uh, please do so. We have to document who's here for the technicalities of the annual meeting portion of the event. We'll take about 15 minutes, and then we'll get to the really interesting part of the meeting with all of the presentations. Um, so if you're not a member of Portland Trails, we strongly encourage you to become a member, and you can also do that back here at the entrance table. So don't hesitate to do that. Then you can vote. So who do we have in the room tonight? What does it take for Portland Trails to succeed? It takes all of us. Everyone that's in this room is helping Portland Trails succeed in one way or another. So we're going to do a little exercise here. When I call out a category, if you fit in it, stand up. So who here is among the 1,700 volunteers that have worked on our trails in the last year to keep them in good shape? Go ahead and stand up. Who, who is here that are one of the 200 people that have volunteered at various events to help those events go smoothly over the course of the last year? Go ahead and stand up. Who, who are our corporate partners that are here this evening? Please stand up. And if you've stood up, keep standing. Don't sit down. Our corporate partners. How about race participants? Who ran the Trail to Ale or the Holiday Dash this year? Go ahead and stand up. Who's, who's a member? All of our members, please. Go ahead and stand on up. Stand on up. How about board members and advisory trustees? Stand on up. All right, who do we have that are bike riders? Who's been on a trail in the last year? All right, if there's anybody who didn't stand up yet, you have to come see me so I can get you out on a trail. Thank you so much to every single one of you for all that you do to support Portland Trails. We're only able to do the work because we have so many great supporters. I want to thank the people that have supported this event this evening, certainly Oxbow Brewing and Bottling for this great event <laughs> venue. We also have some excellent food over there on my far left, coming from Dutch's, from Standard Baking, from Trader Joe's and from Dean Sweets. So don't miss it. Be sure and, and help yourself at some point this evening. As I've said, our work takes a lot of people. And what I want to do next is highlight the many committees that our board has, because these are great ways for you to get involved. I'm going to introduce the committee chairs so you'll know who to search out uh, over the course of the evening if you would like to get involved on a committee. So first, the Finance Committee, Yvonne Mume, over here. <clears throat> Trails and Active Transportation, we have Mark Arienti. He was somewhere. Mark, you're hiding. He's here. The Communications Committee is chaired by Laura Barger. There she is. Our development committee is chaired by Laura Greenstein. It's great that development is popular because it's very important and it doesn't mean developing real estate. <laughs> Place, our placemaking work group is headed up by Kate O'Brien. And finally, we're actively working to organize a conservation working group. So if that's an area that you have expertise in, would like to get involved in, please see either myself or Kara over the course of the evening. It's important work um, that we do. Our focus, as I'm sure all of you know, 
uh, for Portland Trails is to work to create a healthier community through trails, through active transportation, through conservation, and through community building across all of greater Portland. That's why we're here. That's what we do every day. We've had an excellent 27th year uh, with a lot of different accomplishments. Some of them I'll run through. We've greatly strengthened our trail steward program thanks to uh, support from Evergreen Credit Union who's represented here tonight. So the, the, our trail stewards are the folks who commit to going out on a particular trail or segment of trail every week to help us know if there are maintenance issues or things we need to be mindful of. When you have a staff of five and 70 miles of trail, it's wonderful to have those extra eyes to help maintain it all. So we're really excited about the trail steward program. We've made significant trail upgrades in Evergreen Cemetery, in the Four River Sanctuary, and in Virginia Woods. Hopefully some of you have seen some of that work. We've made progress restoring the health of the forest and estuary systems at Burley Mile Pond uh, and in the Brickyard Point in Falmouth. We've had a sixth year of successful Sundays on the boulevard where the boulevard is closed so everyone can skate and play, ride their bikes, have a great time on Sundays. That will start in May, so start planning some fun on the boulevard. In collaboration with the City of Portland Parks, we made significant trail upgrades in the trail network in Presumpscot River Reserve. And we're so very fortunate to continue to have very positive collaboration with the municipal staff and many departments across Portland, South Portland, Falmouth, and Westbrook to get our work done. We had our 19th running of the uh, Trail to AL 10K. That, of course, means this year is the 20th, big one. We had our ninth running of the Holiday Dash in December. Again, 10th one coming up, big one. And I think the last uh, thing that I'll highlight that was um, really, really wonderful was that we were able to significantly raise our profile on the international stage this year as Carol was invited to speak at the World Trails Network Conference in Barcelona at the very end of September. Basically, <laughs> basically introducing the concept of urban trails and uh, pointing out how very valuable they can be in cities uh, and communities uh, of our size. So that was super exciting and really what it did for those of us working closely with Portland Trails, uh, it was a real moment to step back and just realize what a very unique and valuable resource we have right here in greater Portland, helping us have a healthier, more vibrant community to live in. So wonderful work happened uh, in 2019. Thanks to everyone who made that possible. As I've said, this work takes all of us, this room and about 2,000 more people when we add up all of our volunteers, but there are certain people that deserve some very significant and special recognition. And that is the teeny tiny staff of Portland Trails driving it all. So I would like to take a moment and introduce Kara Waldrick, our executive director. <laughs> Jamie Parker our Trails and Active Transportation Manager. Daniel Bishop, our Stewardship and Volunteer Manager. Nancy Grant, our Advancement Manager. Allison Violet, our, our Everything falls to Allison person. And Laura Newman, I don't believe is here, but continues to work 
uh, very actively on school ground greening. Uh, she's an important uh, member of the team. This is my chance. This is my chance to make a little plug. We're right now uh, looking for a part-time communications manager. So if you happen to know anyone with that skill set, looking for a fun environment and a great mission to work for and with, we sure would love to get their resume. So thanks for that. Again, thank you to this amazing staff for everything that they've been able to accomplish in 2018. Um, lastly, I'd like to take the board uh, a second to thank the board. They'll be introduced later. I won't do that now. But I personally would just like to thank uh, the board and the staff uh, for all of their support over these last couple of years during my term as president. We've tried some new things. We've, uh, some have gone well. Some have been learning experiences. Um, but I think uh, it has been a great couple of years, and it's certainly been an honor for me to serve in this position. So thank you to everyone. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate O'Brien, who will run the heart of the business meeting. Um, I have the privilege, my name is Kate O'Brien, I'm Vice President of the Portland Trails Board. Um, I have the privilege of doing the business portion of our meeting. We'll keep it quick, but if you're a member, this time is for you to do some voting. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our slate of trustees that are up for re-election. Um, when I call your name, please stand. Stephen Wells, original election in 2013. Rob Levin, original election 2004. Jennifer Cutchall, original election 2016. Bill Hall, original election 2016. Thank you. Do you all elect to approve these directors to a three-year term? Hang on a second, wait for it. I would like to call for a motion to approve. Thank you, may I have a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Congratulations, fellow trustees. And now we have a potential new board member who has been nominated to the Board of Trustees. His name is David Marsden. David has lived in Maine most of his life. He's a proud Portland resident since 1987. He resides in the Deering area with his wife, Honor Mack, a professional artist and Mika professor, their daughter Olivia, and faithful canine companions Arlo and Tilda. The family frequents the Portland Trail system and the Four River Sanctuary and the Stroudwater River area for quick escapes into nature. David is one of Portland's top realtors, enthusiastically helping clients find new homes in our wonderful city. When he's not in the office, David can be found playing in the outdoors, enjoying everything from windsurfing or paddling on Casco Bay to skiing and riding the slopes of Sugarloaf. So you might imagine why we're thrilled to have him on a slate as a potential uh, trustee of the organization. May I have a motion to approve David's nomination to the Board of Trustees? May I have a second? All those in favor, please say aye. Thank you. And welcome, David. We've got some work for you to do with us. Um, now may I present to you the full Board of Trustees for 2019. Officers who serve two-year terms. Wendy Surstedt, President until June. Just met Wendy. This is a little awkward. Kate O'Brien, Vice President, who will become President in June. Thank you. Yvonne Mumi, Treasurer. And Rachel Alphonse, Secretary. <laughs> Trustees Andy Abrams, Mark Arienti, Matt Ball, Laura Bardger, Jennifer Cutchall, Matthew Forsythe, Laura Greenstein, Bill Hall, Alex Agerman, Jenny Hsu, Stephen Wells, and David Marston. I'd also like to draw your attention to our advisory trustees. If you could please stand when I call your name. Um, these are folks who help us and guide us in our direction um, in a number of special ways. Colin Baker, Ellen Belknap, Roger Burley, Michael Brennan, Heather Chandler, Jim Cohen, Nate Dyer, 
Elizabeth Ehrenfield, Bruce Hyman, Tom Jewell, our co-founder, Susie Kist, Bob Krug, Bree LaCase, David Littell, Verna Martin, J. Peter Monroe, Eliza Cope Nolan, John Osborne, Phil Parrier, Aurelia C. Scott, Nathan Smith, co-founder, Richard Spencer, co-founder, Phil Thompson, and Lois Winter. Thank you so much for your support. I'd now like to turn the mic over to Yvonne for the Treasurer's Report. It's my pleasure to report to you on the state of Portland Trail's finances. Portland Trail's annual expenses are approximately $500,000. We are able to keep our expenses low as we rely on over 1,000 volunteers annually to help us build and maintain the trails, assist with events, and serve as advisors. To pay for expenses, the majority of our income comes from individuals like you through memberships, contribu contributions to our annual fund, and participation in events such as the Trail to Ale. Thank you. Thank you also to the local businesses who support us through corporate partnership, event sponsorships, and our Adopt-A-Trail program. After our accountants finalized their review of our 2018 fi financials, we anticipate having a modest surplus. Thank you to Portland Trail staff, supporters, and volunteers for making 2018 a successful year. If you have any questions or would like more detailed financial information, please be sure to uh, talk to me this evening. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Wendy back to the stage. So that basically concludes the business meeting this evening. I would like to one more time thank you for joining this annual meeting. I've also got three important save the dates. So those of you that have phones, you're allowed to get them out and put these dates right in there right now. So July 13th, that will be the City at Your Feet modal scavenger hunt across the city. If you've never done this, it's hilarious. It's well worth a wonderful summer afternoon to participate, walking, running, biking, taking the bus, uh, finding clues around Greater Portland. So July 13th, it'll be a wonderfully fun time. Our Trail to Ale, the 20th running of the Trail to Ale, will be September 15th, and that registration is open. So come on out. And finally, the 10th annual Holiday Dash will be December 8th. You don't have to get your Santa suit out yet, but you should be thinking about it. So some big uh, events coming up. Also, www.trails.org, very important and very cool that that is our website. Dan, uh, Daniel's got the volunteer uh, days already posted for the upcoming few months to come on out and help maintain a trail. If you haven't done it before, that's also uh, very much worth your time. So lots going on, lots to keep up with. You can keep up through the newsletters, through the email blasts, or uh, any type of social media that you happen to, uh, to use. So please keep up with us. Please continue supporting Portland Trails. And thanks again for being here. So I'm Kara. I'm the Executive Director of Portland Trails. Thanks for coming to our annual meeting in 15 by 15. Uh, thank you to Oxbow Blending and Bottling for hosting us. Thank you to Portland Media Center who is filming tonight. Thank you to Dutch's, Trader Joe's, Dean's Sweets, and Standard Baking Company for the yummy snacks over there. If you didn't see them, get on them. They're really good. Thank you to our members, volunteers, supporters, our board, our staff, and everyone who pitches in in countless ways throughout the year. This is about you guys tonight. Often people ask us what we're up to. So just a little preview about 2019, what we're up to. We'll be doing some significant trail upgrades in Four River Sanctuary. We are hoping to create a wheelchair accessible trail in Kenko Woods, which is, <laughs> that land is owned by the city and we manage it and we're hoping to partner with residents from Woods at Kenko to do that. Um, habitat restoration is a focus of our work throughout the trail network. We'll be providing mini grants 
to community-driven placemaking projects in Westbrook, South Portland, and Portland this summer. We're enhancing our trail stewards program. These are the awesome, awesome volunteers that go and visit a trail every single week and report back to us about what they find. There are eyes and ears on the ground, and we are looking for another 10 or so this year. So if you're out there walking a dog or yourself or a child or riding your bike through, uh, stop on by the table and talk to whoever's over there about joining the team. We'll have the sixth season of Sundays on the Boulevard starting the first weekend of May. And with the rapid pace of new construction and development, you can be rest assured that we'll be focusing on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure throughout Greater Portland. It's important to keep that in mind always. But why are we doing this work? Why are we transforming Greater Portland into a healthier community for people-powered transportation, conservation, and recreation? Why are we creating and maintaining a network of trails and green spaces and parklets and bicycle infrastructure that connect people with places? I'll give you a few logic-based reasons first. We do it for humans. When a trail or a green space is within a half mile of a person's home, they're much more likely to use it. People who use local green spaces are physically, mentally, and emotionally healthier. Healthier individuals lead to thriving and diverse neighborhoods, better schools, and a more resilient and robust local economy. We do it for nature. Green spaces in urban areas provide crucial wildlife habitat, important air and water quality benefits, as well as natural ways to decrease the impacts of climate change. We do it for the community. When a town or city is built at a human scale versus the scale of an automobile, it encourages healthier exchanges between people. It encourages more walking and cycling. That's why we transform Greater Portland. But how do we do it? That's where you get to the heart of the matter. You are how we do it. We keep chipping away at cynicism by bringing people together, 2,000 of them each year, to get their hands dirty, to invest, and to love their community. We remind people that changing this world is not about voting, is not only about voting every two years, it's also about taking a walk every single day. It's not just about getting corporate dollars out of the government, it's about walking and biking to a local business and spending your dollars there. It's not about you having to solve climate change, it's about you choosing not to drive your car a couple times or every day. It's not about red politics, it's not about blue politics, it's about improving a trailhead with a neighbor who looks or loves or prays differently. The stories you will hear tonight will provide evidence from the heart. We all have stories to share. Tonight you are going to meet some amazing people who are brave enough to get up here and tell their stories under the constraint of the 15 by 15 format. For that alone, they deserve our admiration. <laughs> Combined, tonight's stories reveal the character of our community. It's easy to see where our neighborhoods, city policies, transportation systems, and schools could use improvement. It's easy to complain about what is wrong but it takes an entirely different spirit and set of skills to instead see the opportunity and start working toward a better future. That's the spirit of tonight's presenters. These are the doers. These are the folks that create positive processes and outcomes that strengthen our community. Portland Trails is honored to host some of Maine's change agents tonight. It is their spirit and tenacity and humor and mindfulness that make the Portland Trails community unique. Thank you to each of our presenters. Thank you to our audience. You guys have a role tonight, too. You don't get out of it just because you're sitting. We need you to give your thumbs up, your yeehaws, your claps, your woohoo throughout the presentation. Support people while they're up there, up here. You also have stories to share, and we intentionally have an intermission between the presentations. Um, so that you 
can meet somebody new in the community and share your story. Our community is strengthened by the sharing of these stories. And in order for me to make sure that you guys are all feeling lively and jazzed, um, somebody that's worked at Portland Trails for the longest period of time is celebrating a birthday today. And she'll probably kill me right after this, but it's time to sing happy birthday to Laura Newman. I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's ringleader. You know, often we call them the master of ceremonies, and I was like, hey, Casey, it seems weird to call you a mistress of ceremonies, so let's call you the ringleader. <laughs> Casey Gilbert is the executive director of Portland Downtown. Casey strives to make downtown a cleaner, safer, more vibrant place for all. Her love of all things downtown ignited 15 years ago when she volunteered for her local Main Street program in Laconia, New Hampshire. When she's not thinking about urban placemaking, demographic shifts, or planning strategically, you can find Casey on the tennis courts, the bowling alley, or snuggled up by the wood stove with her fur babies, Koji and Samson. Some of her favorite Portland trails are in and around Evergreen, where she enjoys peaceful walks, especially on warm summer days. If you want to strike up a conversation with Casey, simply mention Australia, her home away from home. Welcome, Casey. Well, thank you, Kara, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all. I'm so honored and humbled uh, to have been asked to MC tonight's 15 by 15 event. Uh, Portland Trails is an organization that's near and dear to my heart. And the impact that they make, as you all know, is both hugely positive and also incredibly visible. Um, when I moved to Portland, I spent the first several months introducing myself to everyone. And there's many of you in this room who are like, oh yeah, I remember Casey called me for coffee when she got here. Um, Kara was one of the first people I met. And when I was thinking about how I might describe her in three words, and you have to give me a little leeway because one of them is hyphenated, um, what I came up with was kind, collaborative, and mission-driven, and I think you can all agree with that. Her leadership is integral to the success of Portland Trails, so you may have already applauded her tonight, but I think we need to give Kara a huge round of applause just for being Kara. As a nonprofit executive director myself, I understand that it takes a village to make everything come together. Uh, so I'd also like to recognize the staff and board. I know you've probably applauded, but we're getting our hands warmed up here. So for the staff and board of Portland Trails, one more round of applause for these hardworking nonprofit warriors. And finally, Portland Trails couldn't do a fraction of the work that they do without all of you. The members, supporters, and friends of Portland Trails. So one final round of applause for all of you tonight, okay? <laughs> Woo! All right, so now you have your applause hands all warmed up. So I'm gonna give you an overview of what to expect, and I think Kara did a good job, but just to debrief again, we're gonna hear 11 presentations from passionate change makers who are doing amazing and impactful work in the greater Portland area and across the state. From land conservation and trails to active transportation and healthy and sustainable communities, there's no doubt you're gonna leave here tonight inspired by their stories. So here's how it works for these brave people. In just four minutes, each presenter is gonna go through 15 slides. Do the math, that's 15 seconds a slide. I have no idea how they're gonna do it. Most of them have done nothing like this before. 
So first, we're going to have six captivating and energizing presentations. Then we'll have a break so you can hydrate, grab a beer, stretch, and connect with each other. And then we'll all come back and give our undivided attention to the final five presenters, who are all as equally and as visionary and passionate as each other. So before we begin, just a quick and friendly reminder to please turn off your cell phones. This would be a great time to just disconnect and pretend you don't even have a cell phone for the next hour. And most importantly, there's three rules. The first rule of Fight Club is, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, there's three rules tonight. That you cheer wildly for each presenter, and I've already tested you, so I know you can clap, that's great. The second one is to listen attentively while they're presenting. So I know it's really easy to get caught up in all the interesting, amazing people who are here with you tonight, but these people have worked really hard on these presentations, so if we can give them our undivided attention while they're presenting, that would be wonderful. And then we want you to discuss passionately during the break and for days and weeks after tonight. Do you think you can do that? Okay, I think we need to practice one cheer before we get started, so how about you give me your best? Way to go, well done, hooting and hollering, ready? Let's go! All right, okay, you've proven yourselves worthy of our first presenter, Mary Cerullo. So Mary Cerullo's thing is the ocean. So much so that when she moved to Maine in 1981, she bought a complete fixer-upper just because it was two blocks from the ocean. Mary, a self-proclaimed dilettante in the name of translating science, has come face to face with 10 Caribbean reef sharks in the Bahamas. We're glad she survived that ordeal to be with us today. Let's welcome Mary to the stage to be the first to ring the bell. How many people here love Casco Bay? <laughs> okay, um, I'm with friends at Casco Bay and I have a challenge for you. If you were to do this one thing, it would improve the health of Casco Bay immediately tomorrow. Does anyone know what it is? Stop using fertilizers and pesticides. <laughs> How does this move? Does this move automatically? It will. Oh, okay. Uh, we started a program 20 years ago uh, called Bayscaping because we recognized the connection between our backyard, including the one of mine that was a fixer up or falling down uh, house that needed uh, all sorts of repairs, but it was two blocks from Willard Beach. Uh, we started a program that's called Bayscaping, which recognizes the connection between what we do on the land and what happens in the ocean. I don't know if any of you remember the days of uh, the Blue Laws, when they didn't have big box stores. Well, that's when things started to change in development. Our program is based on research, education, and recognition. And so we tested water uh, that was flowing into Casco Bay. We tested sediments that we found pyrethroids in. And these are some of the results that I'm happy to share with you online. But we found 13 different pesticides flowing into Casco Bay. And that was enough for us to be concerned to ask people to stop using pesticides, some of which can kill <laughs> uh, insects and kill lobsters. But we're actually more concerned about this thing here, the rise of slime, which leads to uh, uh, green slime on coves, uh, and it's a result of these little beasties, uh, the plants that need nitrogen, phytoplankton, algae, and too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. And what happens is when there's excess nitrogen in the water, it ends up creating all sorts of problems. And here you can actually see where we tested and found that a lot of that excess nitrogen is of course coming from us. And closest to land is where the worst conditions are. Uh, so we have been trying to get people to stop using Things like, uh, well, you can't stop sewage, but it comes from the air. Uh, reduce their driving because it comes from tailpipes and smokestacks. Clean up after your pet. And if you were going to do one thing, lawn fertilizer. Because 
This may look great as a color for your lawn. This is the wrong color for a cove in Casco Bay. And some of you may recognize behind Hannaford in South Portland. And when you get this much green slime, all the little things that live underneath die. And then once the green slime dies, then you have problems in fish kills. See those white dots? Those are all dead fish because bacteria use up the oxygen. And then the bacteria, as they decay the green slime, uh, add carbon dioxide. So I have actually papers back here. Our program gets you thinking about your bay and, the bo and your backyard all year long. How much lawn do you actually need? Maybe if you have a house party, you need a lot. In the springtime, you get to work, you pull your weeds instead of polluting them with pesticides, uh, sharpen your mower blades, and aerate your lawn, and that helps your growth and your soil become healthy. And that's the basis of basecaping. Uh, in the summertime, mow to three to three and a half inches, leave your clippings, they're natural fertilizers, only water twice a week to a depth of one to one and a half inches. Again, you don't want to drown your soil, but you want to help it. And in the fall, you start planting again. And if you were to do only one thing for the bay, do a soil test. And I have kits here, and I can tell you where to get more. Because that'll tell you, you probably don't need to add anything to your lawn, especially if it's 10 years or older. Uh, and then the thing you can do to get ready for winter is to uh, put compost down, overseed, and uh, add clover, and then leave your uh, at least part of your lawn and of your uh, leaves mulch it into the soil. So if you take care of your soil, your lawn will take care of itself. I did it. <laughs> Thank you. I've never been more inspired to go home and pull the weeds out of my lawn. Thank you. Our next presenter is Michelle Pratt. Growing up in a big family in the Adirondacks, Michelle gained a particular affinity for those places of refuge in the woods where she could find beauty, um, quiet, and a hideout from a never-ending list of chores, maybe including some weeding. Having lived in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, Michelle developed a passion for entrepreneurship and was glad to discover that when she moved to Maine, the seventh oldest population in the nation, that she was embraced as a late bloomer, starting a successful company from the ground up. In 2016, Michelle founded Virtual Walkabouts, whose vision is bringing the wellness benefits of nature to those who cannot physically access it. The company was selected to participate in the Maine Center for Entrepreneurs 2019 Top Gun program, competing for seed funding with 40 other new and innovative Maine enterprises. Let's welcome Michelle, late bloomer and social entrepreneur, to the stage. I'm going to ring the bell because I've been waiting for that. Sweet. So if you're in this audience, I'm guessing you're a fan of nature. Any nature fans out there? How can you not be? Nature is awesome. So I want to take you on a quick little nature trip without leaving your seats. Now think about the last best place you were in nature. Was it on the top of Katahdin, maybe Popham Beach, or my favorite, just messing around on the Oat Nuts Trail and then a dip in the Presumpscot River? So I have no doubt that when I made you stop and think about yourself in nature without leaving this room, you had a really perceptible positive reaction. Maybe something like this. You may be smiling to remember that good place and how it made you feel. Portland Trails gets it. Nature has enormous benefits, physical, mental, and psychosocial. Study after study backs that up. The Nature Fix is increasingly being promoted as the antidote to our stressful lives. But what if you can't access those healing benefits? By the year 2030, one in every, six, one in every five persons in the U.S. will be over 65. Many of those people will be living in long-term care facilities. I probably will be, and many of you may be. Um, it, it'll be hard for them to take something as simple as a walk on the beach or a stroll in the woods. That's why I created my company, Virtual Walkabouts. And what we do is we're using immersive 
nature-based 360 degree video uh, to provide nature access to people who can't access any longer. We're working with some of Maine's long-term care facilities right now to provide virtual nature therapy programs in consultation with occupational, physical, and speech therapists for their treatment programs. Our mission is to bring the power of nature to people who can't easily access it using VR technology and immersive video from some of the most restorative places in Maine and beyond. Our goal is to provide the path of least assistance to a nature experience for people. So if you believe, like I do, that recreation and environmental stewardship are only part of the vision needed to protect our open spaces, then connecting people in nature can also be seen as health care. Nature is medicine. Access to it, a human right to wellness. Okay, so what do we do with that? Accessible trails are a really good way to start. But beyond that, there are new ways to bring nature to people who can't access it. Like this, this is a prison in Oregon with a uh, solitary confinement population. And this is a blue room where certain inmates are allowed to access uh, 30 different nature settings um, to enjoy. Uh, another place is, this is a uh, nature bathing um, room in New York City where people can sign up and come and experience a little bit of nature away from the concrete and noise, which you can imagine is really needed. Lucky for us in Maine, we have nature right in our backyards. Um, but in order to encourage a common understanding of how important the wellness aspect of nature is, we need to get creative. And although my business depends on technology, there are a lot of ways to do it without that. More intentional ways of placing something like a bench in a very immersive place can result in the same kind of experience for someone as a five mile hike. So at virtual walkabouts, I'm trying to use technology to bring the healing benefits of nature to people who can't access it. But that's just one way to attempt it. The importance of creating a lifetime of access for people starts with the belief that we're all entitled to natural experiences for our entire lifetime because nature's within us as well as with that, around us. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. That is going to be a tough act to follow. Craig, can you handle it? Woo! Next up is Craig Freshly, who made a living on his bike in Portland 30 years ago. Today he makes a living running high-stakes meetings via his company aptly named Good Group Decisions. We all need those, don't we? Craig is also an author, a Quaker, lives in a co-housing community, and is a below average ukulele player. <laughs> when Craig moved to Portland in 1985, he noticed trucks delivering packages around the city, and he thought, I can do that on my bike. Faster, cheaper, with no pollution. Here's his story. Craig, come on up. In 1985, these little white trucks were all over Portland. This is how people sent documents and photographs. You might say this is how the internet was powered by truck. Until I showed up because I had this vision of powering the internet by bicycle. Before I started in Town Courier, I went out on my bike and practiced. I timed myself making deliveries to see how fast I could go, how much I would have to charge. I invested in a simple brochure and a rate card. We had an express guarantee. From the moment you called, we would pick up and deliver your package within 30 minutes. Well, if we made it in 30 minutes, we would charge you $4. Otherwise, the delivery was free. When I sold the company after three years, we had four full-time riders and we were doing 150 deliveries a day in all kinds of weather. When I started out, the call would go to a group of ladies upstairs from the State Theater. It was called an answering service. They would page my pager, right? The beep would go off. I'd have to go to a payphone, call in, get the information, and do the delivery. 
Over time, we were able to set up an office, answer our own phone, and we used CB radios. Here's the antenna of a radio sticking out of the front pouch here. That's how we talk to each other. In addition to carrying these portable radios, each rider also carried a bike repair kit. Each rider wore a helmet. We had these boxes to protect the packages. And we had a stash of forms that we would fill out for every delivery in triplicate with a pen. <laughs> Back at the office, we would file those forms in this rack, one slot for every different client. Notice uh, these straps hanging from the ceiling uh, for bike repairs. For fun, sometimes we would try to ride this bike while hanging and swinging. We also had a dartboard for fun. Uh, here's where the riders kept their gears, uh, everything labeled with duct tape. Over here on the wall is our version of Google Maps. Here it is. Yeah, we, we had that too. We also had uh, our file storage here in the corner. This is our database slash Rolodex. Over here is our chat room slash bulletin board. Uh, this is a phone, by the way. We got a lot of good press at In Town Courier. This particular article went out over the AP wire, and we heard from relatives all over the country that they read about In Town Courier in their local paper. We had a really nice partnership with Cyclemania. Here I am riding in front of their old shop up on Longfellow Square. They're still going strong, Cyclemania. We, we, had another, we had another good partnership with somebody still going strong. I think his picture's going to come up here in a minute. Mark's Hot Dogs, right? Still at Tommy's Park. This was a tough job. We needed those hot dogs. It was, it was physically demanding, but it was also mentally demanding. Handling the radio, alert to traffic, always having to recalibrate your route based on new deliveries but we also had a lot of fun, both on the bike and off the bike. This particular party invitation, I think it doesn't even give a reason for the party. Uh, we, just, we just had them. Uh, <laughs> here's the party, by the way, if you want to see. That was back then. Today, lawyer, doctor, land steward, librarian. We were different then. And, <laughs> And so was the internet, powered by bike. <laughs> I have not heard the words pager and payphone used in the same sentence in a long time, so thank you, Craig. Woo! All right, like, need a palate cleanser there. Carol Ann Willette is one lucky soul. She remembers a few wise words that inspired and guided her through all of the changes in her career path. Those words, never confuse having a career with having a life. But in Carol's case, she got the best of both worlds as she loves what she does. Running a nonprofit requires a very specific set of skills. It takes the mind of a savvy CEO, the heart of a charitable volunteer, and the grit, practicality, and optimism of a true Mainer. As a longtime resident of the Maine Woods region, she knows a bit of the land. As a whitewater guide, she knows some waterways. And as the former director of the Maine Office of Tourism, she is always ready for the next adventure. Let's welcome Carol Ann. So before I ring this bell, I'm just going to caution you, mine is not half as exciting as the ones that you've seen, but hopefully you'll get some good intel out of it. So here we go. Oh, oh it's because it's a bell, sorry. Um, so very exciting time for outdoor recreation in Maine and across the U.S. And I have to say, when I first heard about an Office of Outdoor Recreation, I would not expect to have been standing here four years later uh, as the director, first director of the new Maine Office of Outdoor Recreation. Recreation is a huge pastime in Maine. Uh, more than 70% of Mainers participate regularly, which is so far above the national average of 47%. So kudos to all of us getting out there. 
It's a big economic engine. Um, it's, this is all about those that are making the gear, making the goods, and making the experiences. That includes all of you. And it's an ecosystem of organizations that are far beyond the buyers and sellers. It's land managers, access facilitators, and educators. And we're so dependent upon our natural resources and also the access. And I know that's been brought up already. Um, unique to Maine is that our access is often dependent upon private landowners, so we're very lucky to have that relationship too. A focus on outdoor recreation is going to benefit Maine as it looks to attract new workforce and grow its economy. In Utah, companies cite quality of life, uh, natural beauty and outdoor rec as key factors and decisions to relocate. And then there's a lot of other benefits to outdoor recreation too, including the social health and educational benefits for all ages. And that's so important for all of us as well. Oh, wow, look at that. So, <laughs> so this is uh, a message that's proven and it's a call to all of us to help share this message around. And I, again, Portland Trails epitomizes what this means and how we move forward. And the outdoor recreation economy movement has been a buzz for a while. But it was early adopters that have really led the changes, especially Colorado Outdoor Industry Association and REI. Um, this is about the outdoor industry as a change agent. The Outdoor Recreation Economy Bill, this Economic Impact Recreation Act, really spurred the activity at the state level. In fact, New Mexico's governor signed legislation, I believe, this past week. So there are actually 13, if not more, states. Utah was the first in 2013. Eight original states agreed on shared common principles, all very familiar to all of us. Um, and each state prioritizes these in different ways, but we're really focused on economic development, and the education um, and workforce development. But the public health is huge. So this speaks for itself, um, but it illustrates the challenge in communicating the message, but it also confirms the significance. So where is Maine in this whole movement? The concept of the office has been in discussion for a number of years. I first heard about it, like I say, about four years ago. Um, final push came from a group of Maine outdoor product companies who came together in 2017 to establish Maine outdoor brands. And they're right here, headquartered with Blaze Partners. Um, outdoor recreation in Maine is big business. Uh, very quickly, spending on recreational water sports in Maine is nearly double the state's local land and value of commercial seafood. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, so this is me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is the new office. Uh, we're, we are primarily rural economic development, public health, small business support, collaboration, elevating Maine's outdoor heritage brand, um, and that's it. Could never resist the call of the trail. This is just one more trail I'm traveling. So thank you for all your, all your support. I'm so glad we have Carol Ann advocating for us. Thank you so much. Amazing. Bruce Rayner was born in Canada and lived in Mexico and England before he even turned seven. In 1979, he started his professional career as an economist, but got wanderlust and took off on a bicycle named Ethel for a couple of years. I love that name. Traveling across Australia, oh, see, we're going to connect right there, North America and Europe, including Eastern Europe. He ended up in Israel and lived on a kibbutz for a year, got a master's degree in journalism, and found his calling. He also found the love of his life, got married, and raised three kids who are all good human beings. You really lucked out, Bruce. <laughs> He's run the Boston Marathon and competed in many triathlons, including the late, four Lake Placid Ironmans. On a summer day in 2007, he was standing in the finish area after completing an Ironman and trying to find a place to recycle his plastic water bottle. But all he saw was piles of trash. There were no recycling bins. So in 2008, he launched a company called Athletes for a Fit Planet that helps races become more environmentally sustainable. 
One of the early clients was the TD Beach to Beacon 10K, which was the first major U.S. road race to earn Evergreen certification from the Council for Responsible Sport. <laughs> Woohoo! Working with Beach to Beacon was part of the reason his family moved from Cape Elizabeth to Massachusetts, but it's much more than that. It's the network of trails, the bike-friendly roads, the local surf break, and the stunning natural beauty everywhere around you. It took five minutes before it felt like home. No, not just home. Home. And he's good with that. And so are we. Welcome, Bruce, to the stage. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about do something. We've created a big problem for the planet. Okay, I'll wait a second. <laughs> Ring the bell again. So anyway, we, uh, we've created a big problem for the, for the planet. It's getting hotter, plastics are choking the oceans, superstorms are more frequent, and soon we might be drilling off the coast of, of the east coast of the United States, which is just total insanity to me. Then there's you and me. Uh, uh, challenges seem overwhelming. This self-inflicted existential threat makes me want to scream. Maybe you do too. But screaming is a waste of energy. Now more than ever, we all need to channel that energy to do something, something. It doesn't matter what, but it does matter. I'm inspired by others who have uh, done simple but extraordinary things. In 1930, Gandhi did a simple thing by walking 200, 240 miles to the Arabian Sea to protest the British tax on salt. Along the way, 60,000 of his country uh, men and women joined him. 17 years later, the British left India, which was the whole point. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. I love this photo. Look at Gandhi's uh, bandaged big toe. L Gandhi was larger than life. He was the change, but he stubbed his toe along the way. I think we need to uh, uh, be the change has become a cliche, but it needs to be reclaimed. And people like Greta Thunberg here uh, is doing, doing the right thing. Millions of students in over 100 countries have added their, vo their voices to the thing that Greta has started. This is one sign. Wait for it. Wait for it. Anyway, there's a sign in there that says, uh, there is no plan B, which is a very scary message for anybody under 16. There we go. Um, so now it gets personal. Uh, as, as the introduction said, I am a runner and triathlete. And about a decade ago, I, did, I was at a race with a plastic bottle in my hand looking for a place to, to throw it away in a recycling bin. There were none. So I'm not a, I'm not a wasn't an entrepreneur, I was an economist. I was looking at ways to, um, I was looking at uh, opportunities to uh, make a change. And so I launched Athletes for Fifth Planet. We've worked with lots of different races to help them with their sustainability initiatives over the last 10 years. But the, my favorite race is Beach to Beacon. And uh, part of the reason it's uh, Beach to Beacon is because it's hometown, but also because they have, uh, we, we help them to achieve uh, evergreen status in terms of the certification standard, which is the highest possible standard ever. So, moving right along, uh, January 1, 2019, uh, it was a beautiful morning, and I decided to start the year off by going plogging. I, I picked up 32 pounds of trash along the road, and, uh, and I got thinking, well, maybe this is an idea that we can, we can promote in, in Cape Elizabeth. So I proposed it to the town, town uh, council, and they approved it nine to nothing. Two weeks a year, plugging is an official Cape Elizabeth thing. So uh, very proud of that. The important thing about Be the Change, wait for it, is not be the change, it's you must. Everybody here, whatever your idea is, if you have uh, some idea to, to uh, implement, now's the time to do it. So, press the button for the uh, sound. So if you have an idea, get going with it. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. You just made my list a whole lot longer of all the things I'm going to go out and accomplish once I leave here. Everyone's been very, very inspiring. 
So we're up for our last presenter for this um, section of the event, and then we're going to take a break. But Jillian Share is up next. She's the founder and leader of the Ladies Adventure Club. I'm going to add that to my to-do list, too. And she spends a lot of her time dreaming up new adventures for her club members. She also loves adventuring out of doors as much as possible. She's a lover of most winter activities, and while she enjoys spring, summer, and fall, her favorite adventure season is winter here in Maine. Good thing, because it's lasting forever. Am I right? <laughs> Although two out of the three of uh, heroes are fictional, Nancy Drew, Phryne, I had to look that up, Phryne Fisher, and Beryl Markham. Jillian also loves being a mom of two amazing teenagers, both of whom she embarrasses most of the time. Let's hear it for Jillian. Adventure and risk-taking make me feel more alive, and both are really vital parts of my life. Starting the LAC was a big leap and has been wonderful, exciting, and fulfilling. And you can see that I think adventure is worthwhile in itself. This is a photo of my mom and me, and me at Tuckerman's Ravine. My mom has always woven adventuring into her life, and she planted the seed of the joys of adventuring in me when I was a girl and a young woman. Starting the LAC from nothing four years ago was a huge risk, but the rewards have been immense. We have over 200 members, ages 30 to 75. This is a group of us in western Maine at Grand Falls Hut. And this is the same group of us celebrating Sue Davis, the Maine Hudson Trails volunteer coordinator, who asked us to stack all of that wood you see behind us. <laughs> Every LAC adventure garners this type of enthusiasm, even wood stacking. This winter, we decided to offer ice fishing. Why ice fishing? Well, it's a predominantly male sport and one that our members had not tried before. The LAC is all about offering new and different experiences to the women in our group. All of the women who went ice fishing loved it. They loved trekking out over the frozen river to the ice fish house. They loved the fishing, even the cleaning, the cooking, and the eating of the smelt. In fact, some of the women told me that this was their most favorite wintertime adventure. And just this past Sunday, another uh, member told me that she doesn't like fishing, she doesn't like eating smelt, but she hopes we do this adventure again because she really wants to try it. <laughs> this was one of my most favorite adventures. I didn't think that I was strong enough or capable enough to try ice climbing, but it turns out that with a supportive group of women, great guides, and hella good gear, ice climbing is totally doable. And this was a less scary adventure. A group of us met on the Vernal Equinox in Wolf's Neck State Park for a walk through the woods, ending with yoga on the beach, welcoming spring. My mom is one of my most enthusiastic adventurers. Here are the two of us at West Branch Pond Camps, north of Greenville, we spent the weekend there with 14 other women, and our big adventure was an eight-mile ski across three mountain peaks. Winter is by far my most favorite season for adventuring. It's not hot, there are zero bugs, and it's a really gorgeous time to be outside. We do adventure in all seasons of the year, though. Here I am on a snowshoe hike with Simon Rucker of the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust. I had just taken over breaking trail from him and I fell in a really deep snow hole like up to my waist. It was actually very tough getting out, but it turns out that tough stuff can be really effing fun. <laughs> Sometimes the last thing you want to do on a crappy weather day is get out of bed to go for a hike. But when you're meeting your community at the trailhead, you rally. And then when you make it to the summit, you're psyched you got out of the house. This adventure took place on a Portland Trails trail to Jewel Falls, and Nancy Grant, your advancement officer, is in that photo. She joined us for her first LAC adventure, and we're thrilled to have the Portland Trails in our backyard. We use them frequently. I leave you with these questions. 
What will your next adventure be? Are you up for a little risk taking? This photo of me captures the first time I jumped off a cliff into the ocean and I guarantee you it won't be my last. All right, are we ready for the next five presenters? Come on, let me hear it. All right. I believe you, I believe you. So the first presenter is no stranger to us, Kara Woldrick. You're gonna learn a little bit about her right now if you didn't already know. She grew up in a much warmer place where outside time was an all day, every day kind of thing. At seven years of age, her favorite hobbies were climbing trees and having picnics with her dog in the backyard. And today, not much has changed. <laughs> Riding bikes, kayaking, trail running, skateboarding, cross-country skiing, they are all vehicles to experience the natural world firsthand. Kara's Instagram account, I hope you're following her, Main Urban Foraged, chronicles her adventures in food preservation and foraging among Portland's trails and green spaces. I can personally attest that her beach plum jam is out of this world. Kara is convinced that places shape people as much as people shape places. She also believes that playfulness and laughter are key ingredients in all successful movements. Kara also moonlights as the executive director of Portland Trails. Let's give a huge warm welcome to Kara. After spending the last year learning with and from trail folks from 35 other countries, I've come to appreciate even more fully how incredible the Portland community is. People often ask how we do it. What is in our special sauce? The beauty of the landscape in which we live is undeniable. Forests, ri rivers, meadows, islands, marshes, Casco Bay, we are blessed with an abundance of riches. The people are something special too. 2,000 volunteers help make the trails and public spaces better every year by getting their hands dirty or by helping figure out how to turn a line on a map into a path on the ground. There is a trail within a half mile of every home and school in Portland, so everyone can use them to get around. <clears throat> we are a private nonprofit managing a public transportation and recreation network, and that is unique. Portland lives outdoors. A morning run, a shortcut to get to a meeting, a walk home from school, a post-dinner family mountain bike ride, whether it's spending time with friends, family, or by yourself, the trails are there for you anytime, every time. Trails are located in convenient locations so people can get to where they want to go directly. And in a culture and time when we often take shortcuts, these routes sometimes make you want to take the long way home. Portland's trails provide diverse curated experiences. Looking for a waterfall? We've got two of them. Stunning ocean views, check. Gritty urban feel, yep, you betcha. Want to try forest bathing? We've got you covered. <laughs> Some people tell us they were raised on the trails. Others, that trail time is better than therapy. We smile when someone says, the trails were my best friend when I was growing up, because we know BFFs are always there for each other. We work right at that intersection of human, ecosystem and community health, often with unlikely partners, but by focusing on a shared vision for this place we call home, together we can leverage the best change for the whole community. Not only are we creating significant infrastructure improvements, a new parklet, a route to a school, a human scale street, but also a healthier community of empowered and proud people. Maine operates like a village, and often, that's a good thing. In Portland, every voice and perspective is not only welcome, but it is essential for our collective success. In most cities, 
sorry, wrong one. Portland Trail's grassroots approach is not only necessary on a practical level, but our core philosophy. We want local residents and businesses to create the experience and destinations in their neighborhoods so that they are invested in the future. In most cities, local or regional government is responsible for trails. Here we have strong partnerships with the state and four towns. This brings many benefits, a few challenges, but overall, we all win. For many people around the world, trails are a special vacation activity, and for some, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But in Greater Portland, we have the honor to be part of everyday life for residents and visitors alike. The story of Portland Trails is a collective story. Every person here is part of our special sauce. You have made it happen. Thank you for your energy, your time, passion, your financial support, your humor, and your humanity. Just look what you've done. Next up, we have the dynamic duo of Azaneda Pedro, also known as Lucy, and Nehrut Nagwani. Azaneda is an environmental change maker who enjoys reading books, watching movies, and eating chocolate chip ice cream with a brownie. We're gonna be good friends, I can already tell. If she could meet anyone, it would be Buddha, who is full of wisdom. Azaneda's friends describe her as a person who they can always count on, is fun to be around, and is kind. Nehru is also an environmental change maker and is passionate about working at the intersection of the environment and social justice. When Nehru is not working on those things, she can be found helping to lead trips with outdoor afro, cooking, spending time with her friends, and dancing. She grew up in Portland and currently resides on Peaks Island. Please welcome Azaneda and Nehru. <laughs> Sorry, I don't like speaking in public. <laughs> but we're going to do it. Yeah. OK. Imagine a Maine where everyone has, a, has affordable access to healthy, locally grown food where everyone has a place to play outside, access to clean water and air. Imagine a sustainable Maine where, with bikes and walking routes connecting us, with increases access to public transportation, where everyone, where all of our energy comes from renewable resources. Just imagine a Maine where youth are part of the decision-making processes. And I have this down. <laughs> and here's their knowledge and ideas to solve, it, solve environmental problems. Where, whew, where we work across generations and differences um, to solve environmental, sorry. <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> All right. Um, where we work across generations and differences to create innovative solutions. Where passion turns to policy and where we see representation in environmental spaces that reflect all main people. Does it really matter that we saw behind? <laughs> now, now looking at our reality, we face a deep isolation. We are the most rural state in the country, which makes it hard for passionate youth um, to build environmental connections with each other, to find mentors, and our cultural differences can also be isolated. Uh, youth in marginalized manners are often left out in, in, the, in environmental decisions. When thinking about solutions, we know there are many kinds. We have created a people-powered solution, innovative, need-based, and responsive. The Maine Environmental Change Makers Network connects and builds hope across our isolation. We are youth-led and intergenerational, we share knowledge, skills, and values, bridging the gap between generational differences. Our stories connect us across our differences. Our hunger to be heard makes us fearless. Our love for the land and community unite us. We break down barriers for people to connect to the outdoors. We create opportunities 
for young people to see themselves represented in environmental leadership. We create opportunities for shared learning. We share our skills and knowledge with each other. We identify areas where we need to grow and support each other to grow. We break down barriers to accessing learning opportunities. We collaborate with established environmental organizations to share meeting spaces, financial support, training opportunities, and mentorships for youth in our network. It's easy to feel hopeless if you feel powerless, if you feel like your voice is not being heard. Together we create a voice, we build environmental solutions, and we take action. We're not waiting for the future. We're bringing the future we imagine to the present. We are changing the narratives. I do this work, well, I do this work for a multitude of reasons. But mainly, I do it because I have a niece who I love. And when she grows up and she's ever interested in coming into the environmental sector, I don't want her to have the same barriers that I did. I do this work because I want women like me to be able to get into this field of work. We, we are, are the main, main environmental change makers. makers. <laughs> Our future is no doubt in good hands. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Doug Welch is executive director of the Maine Island Trail Association a 30-year-old, 6,500-member organization that created and manages the nation's premier recreational water trail. Doug and a staff of eight encourage the public to steward and enjoy Maine's islands through inspiring adventures, hands-on service projects, publications, social media, a mobile app, and a commercially successful beer. It's delicious, I can attest. Before MIDA, Doug developed programs for the Boston Harbor Islands National Park. He has a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and a BA from Wesleyan University. He lives with his wife and daughter in Portland. Let's welcome Doug. Um, I'm glad I can see the slides because I basically don't have any notes here, so uh, I'm just going to get myself settled. All right, so I should really have called this Our Plastic Life because we're all in this together, but I, I wanted to uh, give a little personal reflection on the role of plastics in my life and in the world. And across the bottom here, you're going to see a timeline that's going to track us from the 1930s when plastic was invented in New York City. It was meant for, they were developing a kind of shellac and they found that they could mold it into things like billiard balls and telephones and even jewelry. It was, so, it was such a classy thing back then. <laughs> then in the 1940s, World War II gave plastic lots of new roles. Uh, in the 60s, it was a joke in the, at the movie The Graduate that plastics were the future. And sadly, that was true because in the 70s, single-use plastic took off and uh, has really changed uh, the face of the earth. Now, in 1975, I was nine years old. and. I love the coast of Maine. This is a painting that I pa uh, painted. See the little people down there on the, on the bottom right? So that's Pemaquid Point. And then in 1986, college, I went to the Bahamas and I saw my first ever plastic water bottle. Never seen something like that before. And I met this completely wacky survivalist uh, sculptor. And he had a very dark vision of the world. He thought we were in for a race suicide. And I was like, chill, man, because this is not such a bad place to be living. But this is what he was seeing. And he was talking about that plastics are going to be a part of our future problems. And it turns out he was right. So by 2007, I was working, lucky enough to be working in Maine. And by then, we all knew that plastics actually kill wildlife um, it, through a number of different uh, manners. And obviously, it, it, it clutters the beaches and makes those pretty pictures less pretty. 2008, it was recognized that we had a sea of trash. We had a great Pacific garbage patch. And people pictured it as being something you could almost walk across. So they had this idea that we could clean this up really easily if we just spent $40 million in crowdsourced money and created a skimming machine that was just going to scoop it all up like a snow shovel, which would be awesome. But, but. 
But the ocean is actually a very violent place when you really think about it. And this is what happens to plastic when it is out there. It's broken down by uh, photovoltaic, uh, photosynthesis and also, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and it gets ground up. <laughs> So then we also are creating microplastics that we use in cosmetics and things. That's just been outlawed. Um, and we also, in microfibers, so this awesome shirt that I'm wearing is actually totally polyester, I will admit. And this is something that's now starting to accumulate in shellfish and also in human drinking water. So let's watch the trajectory of growth every year of plastic production since 1930 all the way up there. And that is a shocking reality. 50% of that growth happened in the last 13 years. All of the 15% 50, 50 of all the plastic that's ever existed. And the packaging is the, is the driving force in this. So styrofoam is still around, and I, show, I mentioned that painting that I had painted. So this is a piece of 43-year-old styrofoam, and I brought it along so that you could see that it actually still exists, it doesn't break down, and, and the notion of permanence is really kind of scary in that kind of context. So we are all in this together. Uh, it is a very hard thing to rid your life of plastics because it's so embedded into everything we buy and do, but there are things you can do, uh, so get started. I'm gonna leave some yellow flyers on the table if you wanna start thinking about how you can be part of this change. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> I think we're so blessed to live in a community that values um, environmental heroes, and, but there's still um, more messaging that can get out there, so thank you for that. Next up is Simon Rucker, who is the Executive Director of the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust, whose mission is to preserve and protect the land surrounding the Appalachian Trail in Maine for public benefit. In his free time, he can be found recreating in the Appalachian Trail landscape with his wife and two children, or hitting one of the many spots here in the Portland area. Some of his favorite AT spots include the Four Ponds area near Height of Land, the Berry Pickers Trail up Saddleback Mountain, and Bald Mountain Pond near Bingham. Closer to home, he likes Laudham Farm, biking around Back Cove during Sundays on the boulevard, woohoo! and taking different paths to the same places through his home neighborhood of Munjoy Hill. Fun fact, and I don't even know what to say about this, he's never hiked the Appalachian, Appalachian Trail and has no desire to do so. Welcome the ironic Simon to the stage to ring the bell. Thanks everybody. Um, before I start, I just wanna say thanks to Portland Trails and thanks to all of you for coming out um, and listening to all this. And here we go. So I'm from the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust. Here's the AT in Maine. And we do these kind of conservation projects, um, big landscapes, um, protecting the integrity of the trail. But as I mentioned, how I don't hike, didn't hike the whole thing, this is not just a landscape for hikers. This is a landscape for all of us. So if you look at the whole AT, the whole thing is 2,190 miles, Georgia to Maine, 14 states, 3 million visitors per year. Um, if that was ranked as like a traditional national park, that would be like number 12 visited national park in the whole country. And it's probably a higher number. Now, when we talk about the Appalachian Trail, we talk about it as this path. But I want you to think about it as much more than just the path. There's the people, um, and that includes towns. There's mountains, stuff, trees, birds, rocks, climate, air, dark sky, um, air quality. And the reason is the original, the guy who came up with the idea for the Appalachian Trail, Benton Mackay in 1921, and here he is looking out at the whole landscape, not down at a trail. His idea was a realm, not just a trail. It's a whole area for human renewal, for health and wellness, um, for getting outside. Now, this is a map put out by National Geographic, I think last year, showing the kind of highest rank eco-regions eco in the whole country. There's Maine in red. The red areas are also Yellowstone, the Black Hills, Everglades. The main landscape around the Appalachian Trail is on par with those. Climate change mitigation. This is um, a map showing where species are going to migrate for climate change adaptation. You can see it goes right up the Appalachian Trail, right up through Maine. And you can go to this website. It's called Migrations in Motion and see this all over the world. Here's the AT, this really green ribbon, this corridor that can be used for climate change mitigation. And if you look at the top, you see number 13 where Maine is. The deepest, darkest green is up there. And you get a closer look. 
And here it is, highest level of ecological integrity of any state on the Appalachian Trail is in Maine. <laughs> Maine is the most special part. Big blocks of forest of above 5,000 acres all along the Appalachian Trail. We don't really have that much at the coast, and there's not really much in Canada. Bicknell's thrush, this is one of the, the rarest birds in Maine. You can see it's right on the Appalachian Trail. It's right in these high elevation areas. Um, it's a refugia for species, for climate change, and um, for adaptation for the future. And there's White Mountains, also pretty good. So here's, what, here's the map. <laughs> Here's the traditional kind of AT map. You know, it's like a red line, a trail, and there's dots on the top of mountains, and you have some towns in there, and there's state parks, and you can see it ends at Katahdin right at the top. But the way we want you to think of the Appalachian Trail is this, a big region with lots of stuff going on. There's 282 miles in Maine of the AT, over 31,000 miles of the NPS land, millions of acres in the entire landscape, four AT communities, outdoor recreation, like Carol Ann said, Scenic viewpoints, historic sites all over this landscape. It's a cultural landscape, too. Without protection, this is what that looks like. This is the AT landscape in Maine. There's no national forest. There's no national park land. There's Baxter at the top. And a lot of this is protected. Not all of it's under threat, but a lot of it is. And I want you to think of this when you see that landscape. And this is a photo by John Orchid, who's in the crowd tonight. This was in the, the Capitol Rotunda for a big national exhibit on the Appalachian Trail. Um, a few months ago. This is a natural level landscape um, that people all over the country are thinking of. This is the backside of Sugarloaf Mountain. So when you look down at Sugarloaf, it looks a lot different. But this is the kind of landscape we have in Maine, and which you know, brings people into Maine. It is important for all these ecological factors, but also for the outdoor recreation economy in the future. Wild East, that's a new campaign of the Park Service. You can see it has all of these factors in it, history, um, a hiker, it has Baxter at the top, it has a town. The middle section, these are the most popular areas for through hikers. The three of the top five are Maine. That's all the regions in Maine. Maine is the best area of the Appalachian Trail. 73 miles, one hour and 47 minutes to get to the Appalachian Trail region. It's not a region that's up there far away. It's a part of Maine and who we are, all of us. So get out there and enjoy it. That's it. My takeaway? Maine is the best. We already knew that, though. All right, thank you. So last but certainly not least is Ainsley. Woo, we got a fan club. Ainsley Judge moved to Portland, Maine five years ago to help start the Portland Gear Hub. We're so glad you did. Thank you. A program of Camp Ketcha. She spent the last 10 years in bike shops and bicycle advocacy groups, outdoor wilderness groups, and on farms. She loves the ability to work with her hands, recycle and repair old gear, and to help enable people to get outside and be active. Here we go, Ainsley. The floor is yours. Hello. Hello. All right. It's a bike bell. <laughs> So I'm going to cut right to the chase. A bike is at its best when it's working and when you're riding it. And maybe it's 70 degrees out and sunny and you're on a beautiful Portland Trail. That's, that's the joy that we're going to talk about. Down the road at the Gear Hub, we receive a lot of free bike donations. Uh, we've come to realize that we're often a bike's last stop, its last chance at life, um, at least a pit stop. Our goal is to keep as many bikes as possible out of the waste stream. So this means recycle, repair, and reuse. We recycle the metal, the rubber, and save everything we can, the wheels and the tires, um, down to the granular nuts and bolts and try to organize it. There's almost always something on a bike that you can save. And then what we can't rebuild into a bike, we try to reuse creatively, like making bike jewelry with neighborhood kids or constructing a giant sort of misshapen wheel dome with friends and families at Payson Park last year. And one of the best parts is we're not really doing this alone. Volunteers are helping us all the time, stripping rusted, salted bikes down to the rare, raw metal. Uh, they remove seized seat posts. They organize straddle cables and separate them out from link wires and M4 bolts from, anyway. Uh, recently, to get ready for the season coming up, uh, volunteers have been clocking about 100 hours every month. I think they're in it for some of that like destructiveness and the dirty work, but also definitely that joy. They're mostly building program bikes for kids and for bikes for all manners.
They're also salvaging things that otherwise would have just been junked. So repairing, reusing. These are some of our favorite tools of the trade. Uh, dental picks, toothbrushes, Chromax, which is a biodegradable rust remover. Sometimes we use nail polish uh, to do touch-up paint work on bikes. So then there's uh, the sorting and storage. On the peninsula, I hear a lot of people talk about car storage or parking is, you know, that's the hot topic. And I would love to see covered bike storage. <laughs> Last year, we took in 937 bikes in donation. And to process, sort, store, and repair this volume of bikes, we are moving them into piles and then new piles and then containers on hooks and on shelves, down at the Camp Ketcha Arts Lodge, then back up again. And by the time it makes it into a repair stand and in front of a student, uh, there's a whole new phase and chapter is beginning. The student starts to learn mechanics by working on a bike that they're about to own and it will become theirs. We work with kids and kids learn about bearing systems. Adults mostly learn how to fix flats. Uh, the kids get really deep. And we try to have fun with it. And we try to dream about where that bike is going to take us. Um, maybe places that we haven't been before. And we'll pull out a map and we'll find the route that will take us there. And we work even faster on making that bike work. And then when we're done with the class and the workshop or even just the retail transaction, it's about to be new bike day. And new bike day is one of the most glorious days down at the Portland Gear Hub. Um, and whether it's a four-year-old who's getting his very first bike, or a 40-year-old woman who literally just learned how to ride a bike that summer, it's pretty special. A lot of them have done the repair themselves, or maybe they worked with the mechanic who built the bike. Maybe they even met the donor who donated the bike. And then there's that final ride for Bikes for All Mainers on the Eastern Prom. And it's really just a chance to celebrate. And we get to ride together before rolling off into our separate directions. And all of this is, is the bike journey from the view of the Portland Gear Hub. But the broader hope here is that we can repair and reuse all the outdoor gear that we already have. And that we can share resources so that more folks can get on trails in the outdoors with reliable gear and the knowledge to keep it going. So thanks. So Kara talked about supporting your local small businesses, which we're doing tonight. And this is just a PSA to remind you to support your local nonprofit too. We heard about so many here tonight that need our dollars, that need our volunteer support. So when you're planning your annual giving or you have an extra 50 bucks laying around, consider one of these amazing nonprofits. Let's have a round of applause again for all these amazing presenters. <clears throat> So thanks again to all of our fearless and passionate presenters. I learned so much this evening, and I'm leaving here utterly in awe and inspired. Thanks again. It's been a true honor. Wishing you all a safe and wonderful evening, and thanks again to Portland Trails. Yeah.